thank you for your applause. Um, looking for Kim, where are you, Kimmy? Can you come up here, dear, please? <laughs> no, um, I've always had an affection for Evangel Church since I first started coming here with David Cranton in 1974 and uh, the first time I attended Evangel I don't remember the name of the street but we were in a theater what What's the name of that? Dundas Street Theater. Yeah. And we went to Sunday school class. Wendy Cooper would have been in the class. And we sat up. No, maybe they kicked all the girls up. Maybe it was just a guy's class. I don't remember. But we all sat up with Brother Sifton Irving upstairs in the theater. That was an experience and a half. I always had a great respect for Brother Sifton Irving, and when I graduated Bible College in 1979, I had the honor of pastoring with him in Lockport for that year. And uh, I always enjoyed coming to Evangel when it was, again, I've lost the name of the street, and on Micmac Rotary, Admiralty Drive, how can I forget? I was there the day of the dedication, it was in uh, what's now Howard Johnson's or something. That we went out for breakfast there down in the park. And then, well, there wasn't even a park then. It wasn't the industrial park. It was just, and then we came up and was experienced many wonderful times there. And uh, when God called us to come and pastor here in 1998, it was the zenith of my life to come and be called the pastor of this assembly with Kim and our kids. It really was the highlight of our, our life. Um, the way we left in 2005, I know, was disappointing to you and was extremely disappointing to me. I just want to thank you because to me, some of the people I love the most in the world are sitting in this room, standing in this room with me right now. And I just thank God for you. I thank God for the honor and the privilege of being invited by your pastor and, and his leadership board for us to be able to return here with you this and be here for this uh, three days, evenings, Sunday. It has meant the world to us. It's part of a healing process that we're all on, but from our hearts to you, thank you very, very much. Um, anybody can make mistakes. Everybody sins. But when some people in leadership sin and make mistakes and make poor choices, it affects so many others. And for that, I'm sorry. But I thank God for his son, Jesus Christ. I thank God for the redemption story. I thank God that he's not done with us yet. And I would like to believe that the best is still ahead for this assembly. The best is still ahead for the kingdom of God. God has planted us in a wonderful place. We're growing and prospering and God is blessing. Um, this afternoon, I just finished a, a two-hour session with the Bible College this afternoon. It's nice you don't have to go there anymore. You can just Skype. And I was with the graduating class from Masters this afternoon, sharing with them, and this is a wonderful story, sharing with them, it was a totally different stream, a different plan that came through the superintendent by way of Owen Black, uh, uh, one of the professors at the Bible College, looking for a pastor who had gone through um, ministry failure, restoration, and redemption 
who would be willing to share with the graduating class, open their heart and share with the graduating class. Kevin Johnson approached me. I said I would. I had no idea of the dates. And only God could do this. I was sitting in the old office here, my old office at Calvary Church in the old chair where I used to sit so often and doing a Skype talking about how God has restored us. Isn't that God? It's only God. Only God. And I mean, I know that there was a lot of planning and there was other dates we were playing with and unbeknownst. And so God knew all of this. Thank God he's a lot bigger than any of us, isn't he? Amen. And I want to publicly thank God for Kim in front of you, wonderful lady that God has given me who walked in grace and mercy and love. Oh. get you up front again now. <laughs> Thank you so much for loving us through this. Great. Thank you. I'm whole again. You know, there's some iron there's gotta be some kind of irony there because Peter's fixing my ear. Wasn't it Peter that cut off the man's ear and Jesus fixed the ear? There's gotta be some irony there. All right, uh, if you got your Bibles or your smartphones and you want to reach for your Bible and your smartphone. Uh, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, and Exodus chapter 19, our text tonight. Where's Colleen? Is Colleen here tonight? She couldn't make it. She's with the kids. Can she hear me? Shout out to Colleen. Hey, if you can hear me. Love you, Colleen. But uh, you have a wonderful pastor, Pastor Carmen, and you have two wonderful... Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't mean to, to diminish... In any way, this wonderful couple here, I didn't mean that. I know sometimes it comes across the wrong way, but I just want to address Carmen first and just say he's a great friend, a great brother. We've been friends a very, very long time. 
And uh, when I heard that you were coming here, um, it made me very happy because I knew that you would bring unity and love and a spirit of Christ and a strengthening and a, the word and just a very pragmatic, loving ministry that you and, and uh, Colleen bring wherever you go. So thank you for being here and thank you for ministering to these wonderful people so ably. And um, Jonathan has proven himself very, very strong over these years. And I love the, the fact that he is not um, using youth ministry as a stepping stone to what he might perceive as something better. Because after pastoring for 20 some years, I've just returned to being a youth pastor and it really rocks. It's really great. By the way, Pastor Bradley Ball says hello. Yeah, he, uh, he emailed me yesterday. He said, I see you're at Evangel. I'll be watching online. So shout out to you, Brad. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And then, uh, starting to read at uh, verse 1 um, of Acts chapter 2, let's, uh, let's actually read this together. Let's read this together. So, uh, how's your version start out? Pentecost. Wow, starts out well and ends really quickly. Mine's a little longer than that. <laughs> Sir Carmen, lead them, please. Everybody read with them, please. Thank you. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 11. I don't know if I'll read the whole passage, but perhaps I will. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai, after they set out from Raphidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Though the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom, a priesthood, a holy nation. These are the words you are speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set them before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on the day of the Lord will come down to Mount Zion in the sight 
of all the people. Okay. I guess you're kind of wondering how to put all these together. Well, there is tremendous significance here between these two events. It's not touching my cheek at the moment. Maybe. If, if I continue to have problems, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll deal with it. What if, what we're called, what, what is the denomination, what is the name of this church? Pentecostal. What does that mean? Why did they choose Pentecostal and not call it Presbyterian too, or the new church, the other church, the way? What? Why the Pentecostal church? He's coming up here. You know what's wrong. Yes. Thank you. I feel so bad making you walk. Why? Because we have a focus on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that took place on the day of Pentecost. However, we don't really fully appreciate the significance of why and what happened on the day of Pentecost and why it happened on that day. And I want to just take a moment because tonight in our process, I want to talk about how God wants to utilize his presence with us and why the day of Pentecost actually happened. What if it wasn't really about tongues? Um... How many testaments are there in the Bible? Two, the old and the new. The word testament is somewhat interchangeable with the word covenant or contract, if you will. So you have the old contract and the new contract. You have the old covenant and the new covenant. But before the old covenant was old, it was also a new covenant. And the new covenant was made when God resurrected the descendants of Abraham who had become an enslaved people group in Egypt. They weren't a nation. They were no longer a nation. They were no longer designated as a particular people group. They had become enslaved. Now, the Egyptian pharaoh was concerned because although they were enslaved and had no citizenship or no uh, nationality. They were not assimilating well. And so he decided that the best, and they were populating. And so he decided the best way to shut this down was to remove the male children. But God protected that descendant of Abraham's group who had migrated there under Joseph and gay and and caused Moses to be raised in Pharaoh's home 
with all the power and all the finances and all the educational tools, the best that money had to offer in the days of Egypt, God caused Pharaoh to raise Moses up in that. Josephus, who was a writer of antiquities outside of the Bible, who a Jewish historian, tells us that Moses actually grew up to be a very advanced general in the, in the military in Egypt and was, became very, very prominent and powerful. But we know that he never lost his connection with the Jewish roots, Hebrew roots. And eventually, because of the oppression of his people, he reacted in a situation and killed an Egyptian. And for that, ended up, migrated to the desert and um, married um, out there and was happy and content to watch sheep in the Median desert. But God had greater plans and God heard the rumbling and the hurting and the moaning and the groaning and the complaining of his people in Egypt and he came and asked Moses to go with Aaron and to set his people free. And then after a series of plagues and series of confrontations with Pharaoh, finally the last plague was that God said, okay, I'm going to duplicate what Pharaoh was doing, only it's going to be horrific. I'm going to allow the death angel to take the firstborn male in all the land of everything, whether it's livestock or human beings, Egyptian or Jewish or whatever other nationalities are here, the firstborn male will die. But I'm going to tell the Israelite people so if they act in faith by something I'm going to give them to do, they'll be protected. I want them to take a lamb, the firstborn lamb, they'll take that lamb, they're to slay it, and they're to enjoy the meal, but then they're to take the blood and apply it to the doorpost of their home. And when the death angel comes and is killing all the firstborn males in all the land, when he comes to their home, he will pass over it, and they will be free. And this will convince Pharaoh to let my people go. Well, that night it happened, and even the Pharaoh's own son was taken. And it caused a great turmoil in the land, but every home where the blood was applied to the doorpost, there was a Passover. And they ate a quick meal of unleavened bread, and they left, and they took all the bounty of Egypt with them, and they struck out, and they made it to the Red Sea. And when they couldn't get any further, and Pharaoh's army was coming, God opened the Red Sea miraculous for them. They went across on dry land, a million plus people on dry land, and all their animals, dry land, they're on the other side, and... Pharaoh and his chariots and his warriors are all coming in on them on the Red Sea, and God allows the walls to fall back in and eliminating their enemy. And Miriam sings, Moses, everybody has a party, and they sing, and then they head out. They travel for seven weeks. Now, isn't it interesting? God and his sevens. Seven times seven, 49 days later, they arrive in the desert of Sinai, and they're at the mountain. God has called Moses up to the mountain, and he says, you know what, you're not a nation. You're a bunch of slaves. You are not who I called out. You're, you're a group of slaves. But he said, I'll tell you what. I want, to make a, I want to make a commitment to you guys. I am prepared to make a commitment that I will make you not just a nation. I will make you a nation of priests. I'm going to make you a nation of priests. I'm going to come, and I'm going to, from last night, I'm going to dwell with you. 
I'm going to dwell with you. I'm going to move in. You're intense. I'm going to be intense with you. Build me a tabernacle. Build me a tent. Keep it pure and holy, and I'm going to be in the midst. And wherever I go, wherever, I, wherever you go, I go, and my glory goes, you'll be undefeatable. You will rule and reign, and the nations will know there's a God in heaven because I dwell in you. You're not a nation. I'm going to make you a nation. My covenant. Go tell the people. Moses goes down and he tells the people, and they say, yes. In solidarity, they say, yes, let's do it. Yes, we're going to do it. And so Moses goes back, and now I'm not going to get into all the details, but we know that it appears to take about 40 days from the time the deal is struck on day 50. 49. Seven times seven is 49. The next day was day 50. On day 50, 50 days after the Passover, God makes the deal and they accept the Torah. And later on, when they're traveling, God says, I want you to celebrate two festivals. The first festival is the celebration of of when the angel passed over. And forevermore, that's going to be called the Passover. The next day after the Passover is called the celebration, or three days later, it's called the celebration of first fruits. And then 50 days after the Passover, I want you to celebrate the festival of weeks, or Pentecost, 50 days. Okay, so be long before Pentecost was a building or a church or a denomination or even a Christian symbol, it meant more to the Jewish people because it meant that it was the day in which at Mount Sinai, 49 days plus one, that they accepted the covenant with God and received the Torah. Now we know that after that, Moses went up and met with God and he took 70 elders and uh, a few others, Aaron. And you know what happened. Moses is taking too long with God. They didn't want to wait. They didn't want to tarry. They didn't want to wait. So they came back down and they began to grumble. And Aaron, along with the people, built a golden calf. They melted down the bounty they got from Egypt. And they said, this calf. How ridiculous. This calf, which wasn't even a calf, until they did it, made it a calf. This is the God who got us out of Egypt. Moses comes down, he's angry, smashes the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and then there's this whole process. Now, what's that got to do with tonight? Well, some time later, because this was only a picture of what was coming, God sent his own son. And his own son, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is the bo my body. When you eat this, remember me. And he took the fruit of the wine, uh, the fruit of the vine, the wine, and he took it and said, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, remember me. And then the next, the next day, by the way, are you ready? Jesus Christ was crucified Passover. Passover. You know, I was talking with Ian about cool numbers, and we've been talking about cool numbers. How appropriate Jesus Christ dies on Passover. He's the Passover lamb. He's the Paschal lamb. And when we apply the blood of Jesus Christ to the doorposts of our heart, when the death angel comes, he passes over us. Jesus said, if you believe in me, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though you die, yet shall you live. 
And on the, on the festival of first fruits, guess who came out of the ground? Jesus Christ, the first fruit of the resurrection. Paul, writing the Corinthians, says Jesus Christ is the first fruit. If we as Christians have life in this hope only, we're to be considered most miserable people. But Christ indeed has been risen from the dead, the first fruit of them who are asleep. We're not done yet. Jesus Christ rose on the third day. He spends a lot of time, 40 some days, 40 days. Paul says, I, I saw him, but I saw him as somebody who abnormally was born into the kingdom of God. But he said, the disciples saw him, the women saw him. In fact, in some cases, more, than, more people saw him than once. Paul says, I have 500 verified witnesses that saw Jesus Christ after he had died and said, yes, I saw him risen again. He was there for 40 days. Then he's on the Mount of Olives and he's talking to them and they're saying like, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen? You were dead. You're back. Now we're going to take Jerusalem. We're going to go in. You're the king. It's going to all, oh, this is great. And Jesus says, no, no, listen, guys, guys, guys. It's not, a, it's not up for you to know the day or the hour. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. Go into Jerusalem back up in the upper room and wait there. Okay? So then, what happens to Jesus? He's caught up in the air, disappears, and they're like, ah! Ah, we just got him back! And an angel comes, angels come and say, don't worry. That's, God, that's Jesus. He's going to come back in the same manner in which you saw him go. Don't sweat it. So go, go to Jerusalem, wait. So they go to Jerusalem and wait. What are they told is going to happen in Jerusalem? They don't know. Here's what they're told. That they are going to receive dunamis, a dynamic enablement. They're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on them. Now they have not experienced the Holy Spirit. They don't know what he looks like, feels like, what he does. They're just gonna go wait for the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. Now, that word witness is a very loaded word. It doesn't just mean somebody who tells other people about Jesus. It can mean the extreme. You will be my martyrs. You will be able to lay down your life for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all around the earth. So on that word, they went and they waited. Men and women, they waited. They did some administration. They had a choosing of somebody to replace Judas, some of that. But most of the time, they sat and they prayed and they waited. On can I just say sort of, they were probably thinking about it. They're Jews. But where would your focus be? Kind of thinking about what Jesus said and waiting for the Holy Spirit, right? If you're in the upper room. But what was going on outside was interesting. Because according to the Jewish calendar, which had kind of been overridden by their minds, by Jesus dying on the, on the Passover, they didn't even really think of the Passover, first fruits. They were not really focusing on the Jewish calendar right now. They had bigger fish to fry. But unbeknownst to them, time had passed. Seven, day, seven weeks of seven days had passed. And people were gathering in Jerusalem from all around all the nations in, 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 in the Middle East were gathering there. And they didn't all speak the same language. They were there from uh, Galilee, and they were there from Parthenia, and there were Medes there, there were Elamites there, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Kaposia, Pontus, even Asia, and far away is Phygeria, Pamphylia, even Egypt and Libya. Oh, Libya is a, a long ways from Jerusalem when you're walking. And these people had pilgrimage there, and they didn't pilgrimage because there was a bunch of people in the upper room. 
Now, because we read our Bible backwards, and we're Christians, we think it's all about them. It's not about them at all. What this is about is remembering that God had set them apart and made them a nation after he took them out of Egypt. 50 days later, he gave them the covenant. And it's a big celebration. And they're gathered for the celebration. And they've been hearing what went on. Do you know what went on when God came with the covenant? There was a dense cloud, there was fire, there was lightning, there were trumpets, there was thunder, the earth shook. And they've been hearing about this kind of stuff going on all week. They've been hearing about when God poured out the covenant and all the noise that took place. And they've been celebrating this. And finally, 49 days plus one, day of Pentecost. And in the Jewish quarters and around the temple, they read the scriptures and they read the Torah and they read how God had shook the mountain and brought. And suddenly, 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 without warning, without any preparation, something happens in a room just off the side. And it comes with what sounds like a huge whistling wind. Wasn't that what we were just reading about? Oh my goodness. Whoa. And then, and then, fire. Oh, you know, we have the nice little pictures of fire that we see sitting on there, sitting there like that, and the little tongues of fire dancing on their head. I don't know. I wasn't there. But maybe it was like a big flame. <laughs> Came down. I don't know. But all the things that they'd heard about inside of the supernatural, that never happened anymore. It was all just tradition and reading and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, a few days ago, this weird guy got up in the middle of the last feast and said, Come to me, all you are thirsty, and I will give you water to drink. And then and they had him done away with. Rumor was that he had been taken out by his disciples to create some kind of spectacle. Now they were gathering, getting on with Judaism. And in this weird place. So they ran over because... Like people just began to grab, what's going on over there? I don't know. And then the crowds are starting to move over toward that room because they know stuff's going on. And someone says, man, there's a party. There is a party. I mean, why are we sitting here reading all this oral tradition and about what happened? They're having a party over there. They're drunk already. Woo! They wanted to be where the party was. And they heard the dance, they heard the, and, and you know, the weird thing was, they were, they were, them all, they were Taurus. And it was hard to get someone to speak in your language. And they could hear people speaking like, it was like they, that group of people were suddenly in that room because they heard people speaking in Median, and they heard Egyptian, and they heard Persian, and they heard uh, people speaking in just about every language at the party. It created a crowd. People were hollering and shouting. They moved over. What is going on here? Have you ever seen it in this angle before? We're always in the room, right? Tonight we're not in the room. We're outside looking in. And it's strange. Because, you know, <laughs> we're Pentecostals. We know what goes on in that room. That's our room. We're Pentecostals. We got a name after that room. Remember, this is there's no such thing as Pentecostals. Just like the cross was just an old, the cross wasn't a special thing that you put on the wall and put lights behind. It was a it was like a machine gun. That's what you did to kill people and really scare people off. The cross was an ugly, horrible thing where you hung people up to dry and hang them there, and you only did it to the worst people, your worst enemies, because that was a deterrent. This is what you do when you mess with Rome. We'll hang you on this ugly thing. It wasn't a beautiful thing people hung around their neck. We talk about Pentecost like it's our little pet. 
The people who were in the place were Jews, and they were there to celebrate the coming of the first covenant. And nothing to do with this. But our God is an amazing God. Because he gave up his son, the lamb that was slain on the Passover, because the Passover of Egypt, though it was amazing, because it moved the people out of, the, out of slavery and bondage and brought them in to be a nation of priests. And because it was amazing, it was just a picture of what he was going to do for the whole world in Jesus. And though when he brought the first covenant, the, the mountain shook, and, and the fire came and the winds blew and it was an amazing thing, lightning and everything. That was only an image of what he was going to do when the second covenant came down. Because at Pentecost, at the Pentecost day, what Jesus did on the cross, it opened the door for the church to be born at Pentecost. It opened the door for the Holy Spirit to come and start a whole new covenant. Jesus opened the door just as the Red Sea was parted on the day of the Passover so the covenant could come down at Sinai. What Jesus did on the cross allowed the Holy Spirit to come and start a whole new nation. But this nation wasn't going to be just Jews, although they were all Jews in that room. They later would be, Peter would say to the Gentiles, you weren't a nation. Now you're a nation. You were nothing. You were nobody. Now you're a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood belonging to God. We're the temples of the Holy Spirit. We're living stones, he was able to say. We're a temple being built up, but we're not being built up on something that we have hidden in our minds or read in a book. God has said what Jeremiah promised. In that day, I will take the covenant out of stone and I'll write it in your heart. I will move in and I will teach you my ways in your heart. We talked about it last night. Here it is. God process. He went from dwelling among a people to dwelling in a people. So, well, I'm not convinced, Phil. It's kind of a cool concept. Can I share some more things that are parallel? I'm not, I, that was a rhetorical question. I'm going to share some more things that are parallel. <laughs> Do you remember what happened? In Exodus 19, it was on the 50th day. This is the 50th day. The commandments were written on the tablets of the heart. Commandments were written on our hearts, Jeremiah. I love what Paul says. He says, if what, if that law which brought death came with glory, so much so that when Moses came down the mountain, the people had to say, Stop! Cover yourself, Moses! Even though it was fading away, how much more the glory that comes now in the new covenant through Jesus Christ. And we with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory with ever increasing glory. The former covenant was written with God's finger in tablets of stone. This covenant is written by God's Spirit and put right in your hearts. Now, this, this one's going to blow you away. David Hawes already knows this, but I want to share it with the rest of you. On the day that the people rejected and they danced around the golden calf, God said to Moses, that's it. I'm done with them. I'm done with them. Moses, I'll tell you what, I'm going to kill them all right now, and I'm going to make a new nation out of you. Moses, who's a picture of Jesus, the intercessor, the, the one who brings the covenant, stands in between a sinful people and a holy God and says, No! Take me and save them! Spoken like a prophet of what Jesus would do when Jesus, only one who could do it, said, Take this and lay all the responsibility of their sin on me, Father. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What Moses tried to do, Jesus did. 
God accepted Jesus as the satisfactory sacrifice. Moses wasn't good enough. But God said this to Moses. Okay. All right, but I'm going to cause destruction here. There has to be consequences for sin. So Moses said, What one of you will rise up and be a priest for the Lord? Who will be on the Lord's side today? The whole tribe of Levi. The whole tribe of Levi. And they're not priests yet. That comes later, and I'll tell you why it comes later. The whole tribe of Levi stood up, and they said, we're on the Lord's side, and they stuck their swords in a bunch of people. Guess how many people fell dead? Tell them, David. Three thousand died immediately when the swords went out. Three thousand men died as a consequence of the rejection of what God did on that day. Three thousand. And God says, I'm not going to have the whole nation a, a priest. I'm going to make the Levites priests under Aaron. There were consequences. But you know God in his restoration. You know God in his irony. You know God in his sense of humor. On the day of Pentecost, when Pentecost was fully born and the Holy Spirit was being poured out, Peter came out to address the crowd who were accusing them of being drunk. And he says, hey, we're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what your prophet Joel said when he said, in the last days or at the time of the ripening, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he went on to preach the good news of Jesus. And on that day, 3,000 people came to Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, look in your Bible. On the day of the first Pentecost, 3,000 people die. On the day of Christ coming and, and bringing in the church, 3,000 people are made alive. Only God does that. And by the way, something else that's cool, when Mo God made his covenant with Noah, what did he say? Go out and be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You don't have to go down very far, and it says, and all the people gathered at Babel and said, they all gathered there and they built, said, we're going to build up to God. And God said, oh, no, you're not. And what did God do? To cause man to spread out, he caused different languages. Now, if that same God wanted to spread his message and bring his people back and cause an outpouring of his spirit and gather people back into the kingdom of God, what would he do? He does an anti-babble. The people from all different languages gather in one place, but they all hear them speaking in their language because the Holy Spirit was poured out. They spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance because he was bringing the people back together as one. And today, there are people in the kingdom of God of every tongue and every language, every skin color, every ethnos. They're being gathered in because God is doing the opposite of what the curse brought. He's bringing them back in. I'm telling you, you know, don't ever just lightly say, well, I'm a Pentecostal. And don't, like, that's like saying I'm a Jew and not understanding the input, what it meant to be a Jew. Do you know that, that we focus on Pentecost because it was the day the church began? I was with a Roman Catholic priest in Anakinish. And they were upset with me because I was talking about starting a church there. And I, I thought what well, was the appropriate thing to do was go see the priests, which there was like 50 of them. The head priest at St. Ninian's Cathedral, Father McLeod, um, invited me to have dinner, and I had dinner. And afterwards he said, I've got just the guy to talk to you. He said, uh, he's one of our priests. He's been doing a series on cults. And last week he did the Mormons. He's done the Jehovah's Witnesses. He'd be a really good guy to talk to you. So then we, the three of us got aside, and Father McLeod said, and I knew he was Scottish, right? Scott McLeod, Taylor. I, I said, he said, are you going to steal sheep? And I said, well, Father McLeod, 
My forefathers got kicked out of Scotland for stealing sheep. <laughs> really hadn't that I made that up. And he got the joke. I mean, we laughed a little bit. But then I got talking to the other guy, and he said, like, so where do you see yourself? Like, as a Protestant as, and the real church. And I said, well, actually, in my view, there is only one church. In my view, there's only one church, and we've made a lot of mistakes. And there's a lot of stuff there, but we all can trace ourselves back to the day when God started his church on the 50th day after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There only is one church. The Holy Catholic Church, the Universal Church of God. It's not at Rome, and it's not at 10 over Leah Drive or wherever the, our center. We're not even there anymore. I don't know where our center is, but it doesn't matter because we're centered in Jesus Christ. We're not part of a denomination. We are a part of King's kids. We're a part of the kingdom of God. We're a holy nation. We were scattered. We weren't a people. We were lost, enslaved to sin and death. And, and Christ has come in through Jesus Christ. We've been made a nation. We're a holy people. Why did Pentecost happen? So we could speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, and we can say, there, I speak in tongues. Do you speak in tongues? Oh, you don't? Oh, I'm sorry. That's a sad thing, you know. We've relegated it to some kind of evidence, and that's not what God wants. I am sure it's an evidence. I'm sure that it's a physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it just happens to be a consequence of a much bigger thing Jesus didn't say this. And I think if, if, if that was the emphasis, Jesus would have said this. Go to Jerusalem and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And on that day, you'll speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives evidence. What did he say to wait for? You tell me. Power to... What? I hear whispers. Because, you know, we wouldn't want to say it too loud in church. Somebody might hear us. Pastor, go open the door. And anybody who likes to say it can come say it in the mic. Ian, tell us. Ian, tell us why did they go and sit in the upper room and wait? To be what? To witness. Power to what? Go outside themselves and say, this is good news. There's good news. There's good news. You can be free from your sins. Jesus Christ has come into the world and God has made a new contract. And it's not just for the Jews now. It's for everyone. And you know what? Women and men are welcome. Slaves are welcome. You know what? Rich people are welcome. We'll even take Romans. Everybody is welcome. There's no such thing as dogs anymore. We weren't even a people. And if you weren't a Jew, you were considered a dog. And now you can be the brothers and sisters in Christ. We can be adopted into the family. God only has one son, but now through the son, he's opened up adoption plans, and we can be all sons. And if we're sons, then we're heirs. And if we're heirs, joined heirs with Jesus Christ. And God is willing to share all the power that was resident in Christ with any one of you. Now that's something dying worth dying for, isn't it? I've got to ask you a question. What is worth dying for? What is worth dying for in this world? Truth. Faith. Is it? Do you know, since I started this message, there have been people in our world who've died for their faith and for the truth in our world right now. People have died for that. And they're not ashamed. Because they're better people than we are. They're bolder. Do you know why? Because they're allowing the Holy Spirit to bring the freshness of Pentecost into their being right now. I want to be filled up. But I'll tell you something. One of the things that's destroyed the church in the West is capitalism. 
I'm not out on a philosophical statement here. This is true. We believe that it's about the consumer. We, we read the advertising. We say, that's for me. I need that. I need that. I need that. I need that. And then we come to church. We publicize and we add, come and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Dance again. Laugh again. Enjoy God again. Come and see what God will do for you tonight. Come and see what God can do for you and your family. Come and be healed. Come and receive. And God is just going, oh, oh, that's so opposite to my message, which is come, let me consume you. Come and give yourself to me. Throw yourself at me. Come and let me have you. I want you. Not what you will do for me, but what I, not what I can do for you, but what I can do for you. What you can lay your life down. I'm saying that all wrong. <laughs> saying it all wrong. Sorry, Lord. But I think the message comes across. I hope so, because that's really messed up. What I was trying to say, and I'll try it again. God wants us to come to him and say, Lord, what can I do for you? How can I be used for you? How can I lay my life down to save another life? How many people would Jesus die for, do you think? No, seriously. I mean, I know he died for the world. But what if, say, the father told him before he headed out, son, it's just going to be about 100. And you know, they're not the best of ones either, you know? Like, they're not going to be famous not going to be big names. It's going to be about a hundred saved and, and people might not even notice or care about them. But those are the ones you're going to die for. What do you think Jesus' reaction would have been from his heart? Did I hear an answer? He'd be sad, disappointed, but would he come? Was a hundred worth it for him? So, what's worth dying for? So here's the thing. The day of Pentecost is about a group of people who went and waited in a room so they might be filled with the Holy Spirit so that in their understanding they might be able to be his martyrs. You know what? Average person is not witnessing about Jesus. And I'm not going to be your judge, but I'm going to ask you, when was the last time you got the words out and said to someone that they might know Jesus as their Savior? I'm not talking about inviting them to church. That's a good thing. All those things are good. But when was the last time you had the boldness, to, the risk-taking to tell them about Jesus? And this isn't a downer, it's not a condemnation, but God wants to fill us up so we can be spilt out, so we can go make a difference, so we can give our lives away, so we'll have the intention and the power to throw away our money at God, to throw away our house at God, to throw away our car at God, to throw away our occupation at God, to give up whatever we need for the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is way more important than anything else. So when I say capitalism has destroyed the oomph of the church, I mean it seriously. Because we are not the consumers. We are to be the consumed here tonight. So I'm not going to say, will you come and receive something from God? I want to give an invitation, and I don't want our musicians to come because I'd like them to join with us. So often they can't enter in because they're expected. And our pastor, I want to invite you anyone tonight. I'm not setting myself up as the person to pray. But since I'm the speaker and I want to invite you up, I'm going to set myself outside of the church tonight and pray for anyone who would come and say, I'm saying, God, consume me. I'm not asking for healing. I'm not asking for financial blessing. I'm not asking for my friend's sister I'm not asking for, I'm asking you, Lord God, here I am, fill me up, so full of you, 
that it spills over and I become a witness for you on my street, in my home, in my family. Lord, this is what it's about. I want to experience Pentecost. I don't want to say I'm a Pentecostal. I want to walk in what Pentecost stands for, the new covenant in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Lord, if you so choose to cause my legs to move, I'll dance. If, Lord, you so choose to cause my mouth to move, I will speak in whatever language you give me. Lord, if you tell my hands to move, I'll raise them up. Lord, I give you my life, and if you tell me to go witness, I'll go witness. If you tell me to, to lay aside my vocation and put my nets away and come follow you, Jesus, I will, because I believe the kingdom of God is more important than anything else. And I want the new covenant. In Jesus' name, I want to be his disciple. I want a fresh Pentecost. Tonight, I want to just verify that. I want to lay hands on you. I pray that God, over the next while, does something amazing in us. But it's not about what God does here tonight, is it? Well, if he never did another thing, what's it matter? He's already done it. Let's respond to it by giving ourselves to him. So just leave your seat and come out and stand, just making a statement. I am, but don't do it easily. Don't do it lightly. Don't see if somebody you respect makes a move first because it won't mean anything to you. Count the cost, okay? Lord, I've delivered the message that believe I delivered the message as best as I could and I've made mistakes and I apologize Lord but I've delivered the message as best I could tonight that this is the new covenant and these are the days of the good news Lord I pray that there will be people among us tonight who will count the cost and say Lord consume me for the kingdom of God. May I die that you might live. And Lord, I pray that each person who responds that way will be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, whatever that means, I don't know, but I know this, they will be your witnesses. They will be your witnesses. Give us witnesses in this place tonight. Find your place with God. I am inviting you to come forward when you're ready because that's, a, that's, a, that's like getting into the, the upper room. It's making a statement to the, to the Lord.